today's story is Ada Lovelace, poet of science, the first computer programmer. Long, long ago, on a cold winter day, a lonely little girl walked from room to room in a big, old, dark country house. Her name was Ada Byron, and she was looking for something to do. Ada was good at imagining things. She imagined it would be fun to fly, and then she went about it in a scientific way. First, she studied the flight and the anatomy of birds. She decided her wings would be like theirs, only larger in proportion to her size. She would build the frames out of sturdy wire so her wings would be strong, then cover the frames with oil rubbed silk so they would also be light. Finally, she designed a harness to attach the wings to her back. She thought it would be fun to fly from house to house delivering the mail. She'd need to bring a bag for carrying the letters, a map, and a compass for navigation. She decided to write a book about her flying project, illustrated with pictures and diagrams. She would call it Flyology. And when she had finished that, Ada had a plan to build a steam-powered flying horse. Her mother, Lady Byron, was away at the time, so Ada sent regular updates on the flying project. She signed the letters, your affectionate young turkey, or your affectionate carrier pigeon. She had never been so happy, but Lady Byron was worried. Ada seemed overexcited. Worse, she showed dangerous signs of too much imagination. In other words, she was acting like her father. Ada's parents were as different as chalk and cheese. Her father, the famous poet Lord Byron, was a worldwide celebrity, the rock star of his time. Her mother, Lady Byron, was interested in math and science. She was rational, respectable, and strict. The marriage only lasted a year. Ada never really knew her father. He left England soon after she was born and died in faraway Greece when she was eight. She wasn't even sure what he looked like. His portraits had been covered with cloth. Being Lord Byron's daughter shaped Ada's childhood in important ways. Ada's mother wanted her to be calm and rational, not emotional and creative like her father. She hoped the study of math and science would suppress her daughter's imagination, so Ada was given a world-class scientific education. But her imagination was not harmed in the least. Ada loved machines. She lived during the Industrial Revolution, when things that were once made by hand, from ribbons and spoons to paper and glass, were being mass-produced in factories. When Lady Byron suggested a trip to see the new factories, Ada was thrilled to go. Everything they saw was interesting, but by far the best was the mechanical loom designed by a Frenchman named Joseph Marie Jacquard. It could automatically weave cloth in any design you could imagine, from a simple plaid to fancy brocade, to actual pictures of people, trees, and animals. It was amazing. But how did the loom know which pattern to weave? That was the amazing part. The design was translated into a pattern of holes punched into a heavy paper card. Long chains of these cards were fed into the loom, giving it instructions. To change the design, you only had to change the cards. Ada was amazed. It was a brilliant idea, and not just for weaving cloth. Why not use punch guards to direct other machines for other purposes? Ada was on to something. Soon she would see how right she was. At 17, Ada's quiet childhood came to an end. Her mother took her to London for the summer social season, a round of teas, dinner, and dances. Ada was dazzled by the gilded ballrooms and the beautiful ladies in their gleaming satin gowns. Everyone wanted to meet Ada because she was Lord Byron's daughter. But Ada didn't know what to say to them. She didn't care about fashion, fox hunting, or court gossip. Then she went to one of the weekly gatherings at the home of Charles Babbage, the great mathematician and inventor. All the interesting people went to his parties, from the writer Charles Dickens to the scientist Charles Darwin. As Ada moved through the crowd from one amazing conversation to another, she grew almost dizzy with excitement. They talked about important things like astronomy and politics, literature and art, and the latest engineering marvels. These were her kind of people. A few days later, Ada went to see a working portion of Babbage's new invention, a calculating machine called the Difference Engine. It could solve arithmetic problems at the turn of a crank. People called it a thinking machine, 
But Ada knew better. The intelligence was not in the machine itself, but in the genius of its designer. Ada felt an instant connection with Charles Babbage. She even dreamed of one day helping with his important work. And so began one of the most remarkable friendships in the history of science. But Lady Byron had other plans for her daughter. Ada didn't need a profession. What she needed was a husband. So at 19, Ada married a wealthy aristocrat, William Lord King. When he became the Earl of Lovelace, Ada Byron King changed her name once again. She would go down in history as Ada Lovelace. By the time she was 24, Ada had two children running wild in the nursery and one still crying in the cradle. But she hadn't lost sight of her dream, just postponed it. Now at last her moment had come. Babbage was working on a revolutionary new machine called the analytical engine. It would be powered by steam. There was no electricity in those days. And it could do much more than just add and subtract. Funny how it was powered by steam, like the steam locomotive we read about last week. The analytical engine could run any kind of mathematical calculation, then store the results for later use. Best of all, he had borrowed Jacquard's idea of using punched cards to direct his engine, so it could easily change from one operation to another. In short, Charles Babbage had invented the first fully programmable, all-purpose, digital computer. But there was a problem. So far, his engine was just a plan on paper. It would cost a fortune to build. To raise that kind of money, Babbage needed publicity. This was Ada's chance to help. An article had been written about the analytical engine, but it was in French. Ada translated it into English so it could be published in Britain. Then Babbage asked her to add some footnotes at the end, explaining what an all-purpose computing machine could do. She was perfect for the job because she understood how the engine worked. She was a good writer and she had the vision to see better even than Babbage himself, how much more a computer could do besides just processing numbers. It could work with any kind of symbol, from words to musical notes. Or coding, as you guys like to say. Ada imagined the analytical engine writing text, composing music, reproducing images, even playing games like checkers and chess. But before the machine could do any of those things, the symbols and rules of operation had to be changed into digital form. Today, we call that programming or coding, as you guys like to say. Ada needed to explain to her readers exactly how that could be done. As an example to work with, she and Babbage chose an extremely complicated series of calculations called the numbers of Bernoulli. And then Ada showed step by tiny step how they could be coded for the machine. Finally, after nine months of meticulous work, sketch of the analytical engine invented by Charles Babbage was published. Ada's notes by the translator were almost three times as long as the original article and far more important. Yet she wasn't credited by name, only with the initials A-A-L. She was afraid her work would not be taken seriously if people knew it was written by a woman. Ada didn't care. The girl who had once dreamed of flying, who longed to do something important with her mind, had soared at last. She had looked into the future and imagined a computer age that wouldn't arrive for another hundred years. And in demonstrating how to code the numbers of Bernoulli, Ada Lovelace had written the first computer program ever published. Sadly, she died of cancer at the age of 36, the same age as her famous father. Babbage's analytical engine was never built, and in his later years, he was dismissed as a failure. Though their partnership marked the beginning of the computer age, there is no direct link between their work and the development of the modern computer. Babbage's groundbreaking invention and Ada's visionary writings were all but forgotten. Years later, Ada's translations and notes resurfaced. We know that Alan Turing, the computer pioneer who helped break the Nazi Enigma code, had read them. He was especially interested in her assertion that computers were incapable of original thought. He called this Lady Lovelace's objection. Howard Aiken, who helped design the Harvard Mark for IBM, read them too. 
If Babbage had lived 75 years later, he said, I would have been out of a job. In 1991, a full replica of the Difference Engine No. 2 was successfully built by a team from London Science Museum. It worked perfectly. In 2011, the same team launched a second, far more ambitious effort to try to make the analytical engine. They expect this job to take 10 years, so stay tuned. You might see something of it yet. 